Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Ederson de Souza. I'm a software engineer at Intel uh, for some time already, and in the last two and a half years I've been working with Zephyr. And this morning we'll be talking about, uh, or I'll be talking about, or you'll be talking about, the future of Zephyr device module. Uh, this is the agenda, we'll talk about current interest, what is the device module, and and some topics, assorted topics about the future of device model. A disclaimer, I'm no oracle, no seer, so it's not like I'm seeing this from the future and I'll be presenting to you. It's actually being built, I'm helping, and I need your feedback, actually. So this is to start getting some ideas, uh, some use cases, some constraints. I have some code that I kind of prototyped for some of those uh, topics, and I will uh, need your feedback to evolve that. What is the device model? Well, basically it's how Zephyr model devices. So the life cycle, how do we define their APIs, how they connect, how, how devices work on Zephyr, how do we, do we manage them? And in this uh, slide you can see a collage of some assorted uh, issues uh, and pull requests relating to the device model. A parenthesis here, uh, I wanted to have like a nice collage with the newspaper headlines, and, but uh, I'm no artist, I'm no designer, so I, okay, let me ask some of this AI stuff to do it for me. And why it created something that reminded the collage, the text was like alien, it's gibberish, it cannot create something with real text, so we have to resort to the software developer trying to be an artist here, so sorry for the not so beautiful uh, collage. And some of the topics in there uh, are related to how do we, the life cycle of the device, how we initialize them. Maybe we don't want to initialize them at boot as Zephyr uh, has always been done. Uh, some people want to extend the API so you can like have a uh, new API on top of something instead of like having to create a totally new API for, for some specific device and more. Uh, actually, the, there are some, some of those issues are actually wish lists, so there are many things. Uh, and I want feedback, so please talk, of course, it will be at the end, so I'll try to go fast to, to give some uh, few minutes or several minutes to, to get feedback. Uh, although the, the talk is about the future, the first topic is actually about the past, because last week the, the deferred initialization, initialization was merged. What is that? Uh, so far, Zephyr had been initializing all devices on boot before your, the main uh, function of your application starts to run. And in some cases, you don't want that. If for some reason, maybe you have some device that won't be there or won't be needed for some specific use, and well, they would be initialized. There was an issue for that, it probably is one of those on the collage, and there was a length discussion started like in 2021, I think, and yeah, and uh, it was a really fruitful one, There's, uh, people come up with some ideas, they decided on, on one, try to implement that, when they implemented they saw that wasn't that good, then try to implement another one, and finally the, it was merged last week, and it's a really, really simple one, you just uh, notate on your device that, on the device tree that's going to be deferred, and Zephyr will skip it during boot, so it, it won't be even checking, it, uh, you use some linker trickery to separate the the initialization of that, the code that initializes that device in a separate section, so it's kind of no overhead there. And then, of course, you want to initialize it later, so there's a new API that you can use to initialize the device. But this is about the past, but there's a lesson learned here. Uh, during the implementation of this, there was a, a detour. Some ideas appeared, a new pull request was created. It seems nice that there were some really nice uh, features there, but there were a disconnect with the issue. So people that were discussing the issue were not on this uh, second pull request, and so we kind of lost some institutional information about the issue. Uh, after some time we got back there, we could get in touch with the people, so the lesson here is, if your pull request starts to deviate a bit from the issue that it was supposed to be fixing, try to get the people from the issue on your pull request because otherwise you may lose some information and something completely different than was agreed will be merged. Uh, talking about the near future, why I call this near future? Because I have a pull request uh, as a work in progress that, is, that touched some of this area and maybe we'll start a discussion for 
this uh, now. This is about the initialization order. So not only we want to initialize the device, but there's an order that we want to respect. This order basically came from the device tree, uh, but not only. We, have, we also have a priority that we can set for the devices, for the drivers when they are initialized, so that you can ensure that like some function that initializes some registers runs before you try to initialize the GPIO or some other uh, hardware that you want to initialize. And this other function is uh, you use the sysinit macro to define a function that will be called at some point during the initialization. This point is defined by a priority again. This priority is basically a number that you, the smaller number will run fast, uh, faster, will run before first. And then uh, you kind of have to tweak those numbers with the priority of the GPIO, for instance, plus the CCNH to get things done in order. And this is bad because those numbers don't have, don't, don't track the dependencies. They are just numbers that you can tweak to get what you want. But if you change something in the future, which are a new device you want, you will need maybe to change all the numbers before and after to get there. So not ideal. I have sent some pull requests to fix some of those issues. So uh, we don't want that. How does that work now uh, inside Zephyr? Is basically, we have the init entries. That's a section inside the file. Uh, it's divided by uh, levels. So we have like the pre-kernel, pre-kernel 2, post-kernel. And inside of uh, each of those levels, we sort, like with linker script trickery, the sections. So every sysinit or the device in it, device tree in it uh, function have a name that takes like the level, the priority, and sub-priority, and then the sort this. So we can have like, a, so that's how the order is defined, and then Zephyr will be looping over those init entries and initialize them. The init entries is basically a pointer, excuse me, to a device and a function that will be called. If it's a, just a CCNH, it's just a function. You can check the order uh, using westbuild-t init levels. It's helpful to debug. Uh, and here there's something, I'm not sure if you can see, interesting. This is from a real build. So I was getting the, the data there and trying to create this diagram. And note that the pre-kernel 140 and pre-kernel 140. So both the ECIA and the SOC needs have the same priority. But the SOC needs to go after because like it's an underscore, the next one is lexicographical order. If it was zero, 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 it would be the other way. Suspicious. Uh, so how can we tackle that? Uh, proposal, and this is the very first one, so I, I, I'm hoping to reiterate that, is let's use the names. Which names? For the functions, for the system each functions, we can basically uh, use their names. For the devices that you want like to be initialized before or after, right now I'm using the compatible, uh, because it's a name that's already there. Maybe it's not the best name. Maybe we should have like, instead of tr using the compatible, we could use like just GPIO. But then we would have to name the devices like, this is GPIO, this is UART, this is UART early because it's another UART that you want to use on, on a different moment. So this macro basically defines the, the uh, function that we're going to call. The first argument is like a semicolon separated list of all things, devices and functions that you want this to run before, and the second is the ones that you want to run after. So if you go back, I want this SOC need to run before GPIO and after the ECIA. This is the final code, but we need a way to override it, and uh, I'm not sure a good way to override it. We could have like a separate file, but usually we don't want separate more files on Zephyr, so I decided to use the kconfig, but maybe this is abusing the kconfig. But basically, in this initial prototype, uh, you can name, uh, you can aptly name your uh, config that then will be looked uh, to override the definitions uh, on code. And if, uh, being a K config, you could also use the PRJ conf. Uh, maybe some of you noticed that I use serves as the name for the serves. And I've been told that this is old, Zephyr is more mature now, we don't want those uh, jokes uh, with a Z or Z. So, there's a small parenthesis here. 
I want to ask a question. Who thinks that Zephyr now is like more mature, doesn't need to have things starting with Z? <laughs> and who thinks that Z is too cool? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so how it becomes, basically. Uh, all that information, the, now we have a two-step build that is kind of mandatory. The first step build, we just build it as is right now, because we want to integrate with QNT functionalities. We don't want to change the world. I mean, Zephyr doesn't shy away from changing everything from time to time, but let's try to avoid that. So to be compatible with what we have right now, we would build it. So every season eight and device three entry will be then read from the ELF file, so we can see what is the current order. This is added on a topological list with the constraints like this comes before the other one. We then read the ELF file again to read the service entries, uh, the kconfig. We place this in this list and then we sort it. This is done by a script, uh, Python 1. So after this, we have like a topologically sorted list of entries, and we use that list of entries to create the unlinker script snippet that will be used to generate the order. So now the SOC init is properly after the CIA. I'm not sure if that's the right order, but I'm assuming it was working, right? There's no bug reports about this. And uh, before the GPIO. And if your GPIO is not enabled, remember that list can be a, a semicolon separated list. So you can say that, oh, I want the SOC need to run before GPIO or before I2C or before anything. If there's, then it, all these constraints will be added to the list. So the list generator will respect that. And if GPIO is not there, it should be fine. But if no, in this my, my first uh, prototype, if there is no dependence, then I, I, I will error because maybe something is wrong. Maybe you missed something. The device. Uh, Snip device, the linker script snippet uh, looks like this. So there's no sorting anymore. It's like a full split thing that was created by the, the script. And then we build again. Then we have the second step of the build. We build again. And ideally, it should be idempotent with what we have right now. So we should, if we enable this right now, it should just work. I'm not sure it does uh, because uh, some uh, device have more than one compatible. I'm not sure how to handle that yet. And uh, right now I'm taking the first one <laughs> using. It builds for, some, for the things I tried, but maybe it will break something along the way. I also, uh, one thing to mention here that I was experimenting is like you could use that to a specific instance of a device, so a GPIO tree, the third instance. The problem is how to get that information, which one is the tree? Because uh, I first tried to use that number that you get from the DT for instance array, but that number is actually arbitrary. You should not be using that. There's documentation about not using that. So it's not good. Uh, I thought about trying to use the ordinal, but then the ordinal is like crazy. Here, the ordinal the, for the first GPIO is 13. It starts, how do you get that? And probably changes with the build too, so mm, not. I thought maybe mapping zero to the first instance, one to the second, but then again, it won't be really good because now is another number to confuse. Maybe I should be using the address. I don't know, that's a question. And uh, this is uh, the link for the PR, if you want to look at it. I created as a draft, so I'm, I was kind of hoping no one would look at that because it's a draft, but there are some comments already. Uh, so, <laughs> do you see, device, uh, the device module is kind of important and people are interested in it. Uh, so, please uh, comment there and, uh, and here after, uh, I think it, um, I'm fine on time, so we'll have some time to discuss this one. For the not so near future, I also was working prototyping some uh, stuff, some ideas here, and uh, I I wanted a way to notify the, the application that some devices failed the initialization. You can do that right now. The application can get the, uh, there's an API call that you get the first device in an array, and then you can loop iterate over it and check the state and the init res result. Uh, but that's kind of boring. I wanted to see if like, uh, could we notify the application? Like if the application 
a simpler API for the application. So the application kind of subscribes to a topic and get this information from there. And, uh, and we have like a Zbus that does exactly that. So I got curious and I tried. Okay, it seems to work. So I kind of got crazy with this. I kind of found a hammer. So I'm, maybe I'm trying to uh, treat everything as an, uh, a nail here. Uh, but then, for instance, for the device, uh, the deferred device, the device that you initialize later, maybe you want to know when the device was initialized. So could we like post on the on some channel uh, this information? It seems to work, although for this, uh, one idea is like maybe the R2C was initialized later, but now you have like this other, the sensor that's on R2C, you want to initialize it too, but then it will send like a message to the bus. Uh, maybe you are not using subscribers, but listeners, and then you, the bus will be locked. So I decided to try to have like a channels per device. So that can be heavy. So there, there, there are some drawbacks. Uh, the bus itself should be light, but maybe having all those channels. But if you don't use them, I can imagine that most of, of those will be compiled away. Uh, the bus is actually needs like the kernel, so it needs like uh, I think you use semaphore, so you cannot use that for early stuff. But you probably shouldn't be using doing much on the early initialization, so I'm not sure if it, there's value on telling at the beginning of the application that oh something failed. Maybe you cannot even respond to that. And the Trojan horse there is because I didn't talk about <laughs> device notifications on the beginning, so it's kind of like I tried that. I kind of tried to show this in this presentation. But it's also useful for another thing that people are uh, uh, desiring on, on the Zephyr device model, that is unloading a device, the initializing a device. Like if there are several use cases. I think that the well, a nature one is if you are like a bootloader entry and you initialize some device to do your stuff, then you want to hand over to the next bootloader entry and you want to initialize the device to give like the device in a pristine state to the next entry. That's a reason. Some other reasons are kind of suspicious uh, because I think that they overlap with power management because maybe you're trying to do a poor power management thing. Oh, I'm not using that device. Let's initialize it. I'm not sure. Uh, and I'm not sure if, even if you are not trying to do something sketchy, how does, how does that inter uh, interface with power management? The, the question that I have for you too, like is it in independent, is it interdependent? So maybe if you want the device to the initialize you need to call like some power management thing to turn it off and then you initialize it from the from the effort from the application what about dependencies what like if you take away uh, i square c what about the the sensors that are, are on top of it uh, maybe you, maybe those dependencies are optional, so shouldn't be a problem imagine like in the sensor again the sensor also is using gpio to trigger something uh, if the GPIO is not there, it's fine. We won't trigger anything, but uh, it's still useful. Uh, and how we would do that? I mean, one way is going like the, device, uh, the power management thing, you have like a device get, device put, so, so you have count things. But I think that right now we are getting the pointer to the device everywhere on Zephyr and trying to like sanitize that to be like, a, you get things, you put things, sounds like a really, really big work. I may be wrong here, maybe uh, not going the right direction. And there will be like a long tail of subtle errors. So I'm kind of uh, worried of this. And using the Hummer again, maybe we could like notify that the device uh, is going down. And then you, if you care, like the sensor could subscribe to the uh, I2C channel, got the notification, oh, the I2C is going down now. Oh, maybe I should do something about that. And uh, it seems to work, but of course I did just some uh, small uh, proof of concept here. I have also a pull request. This is more uh, WIP, it's kind of crazy stuff, but it shows uh, some really small examples of this usage, the device notifications, the device uh, uh, deinitialization. It doesn't do anything, it's just to probe the concept. And again, if you can go there and provide some feedback, this is, a, this is a draft. I don't think this one had anything, actually. Uh, no one care about device notifications, what is that? Uh, but I, I'm not sure I didn't look today. Uh, 
So I think that's it from what I wanted to tell to you. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, we have 20 minutes to discuss. So let's talk. Yes, we do have 20 minutes. So um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. First question or comment? What is the use case for uh, overriding the priorities that you showed earlier with K-Comping and so on? Why, why do we have to override stuff? We don't do that right now. Yeah. Uh, I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm imagining like an application that uh, added uh, something uh, new and doesn't care about something, some other thing that's there. I mean, I, I don't think about the use case, I think more about the possibilities. Uh, one thing that uh, some pull requests that I, I have uh, sent regarding the changing, the tweaking, the priorities is usually something else change it. And then for that, applica that application, you need to change the priority of something. So I, I've seen applications that change the priority, like in the k-config. Uh, so I don't want to restrict that possibility. I still want the applications to change something. Hi, thank you for your presentation on this. Uh, really good. So, so one thing, if we take the what we have today, devices and sysinit. So one thing that's that's really missing from sysinit and and from what I can tell from from services as well, is the ability to from the application side determine if the service or the sysinit ran successfully. So have you considered a small API, like a services API for querying like devices ready, uh, similar to services ready, um, that sort of stuff. And seeing that we just now have deferred initialization for, for devices, how about deferred initialization for, for services? Well, starting from the end, uh, I think it makes sense. To be honest, uh, maybe many of those things are actually moving things from the build time to the runtime to the side. I think this is a trend, and I think that's valid actually. So, yeah, uh, I think it makes sense. I don't know how, but uh, it, it's a nice use case. Uh, for uh, an API to say if a ser service it did initialize correctly, uh, that's good too. I mean, really, I think that's, I, I, I kind of think that right now the season each doesn't even have a return code, it's, it returns void, so you wouldn't even know. So yeah, that that's a good point. Thank you. Hmm? <laughs> services, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, on the services, why, what was the re thought process on using a string versus kind of how we reference device nodes in other places? And then that opens up however, you know, we have that whole infrastructure, whether it's by label or by, you know, and so forth. So then you could, you know, so I was curious as to why you, you started with a string there for the compatible. Yeah, I started with a string because when the, my first iteration, I actually started with a separate file for that. So in the file referencing like the string is like nature, more natural. And it allows to be overridden from like the, the k-config or from another file. So that's basically the, the original idea. Okay. And then the other one just as a, I don't know, with, I know it's a prototype or it's early right now, but as far as the linker generation, are you doing that in some way to deal with other compilers that aren't GNU linker script? Uh, I, the first, this, the, the first uh, prototype here, I just use something, the, the, the normal stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm actually curious about like some different tool chains. It may, it may be a problem. Uh, I, I really want to test that. So <clears throat> before I ask my questions, actually, uh, what Kumar said about the, the linker scripts, we have an infrastructure in Zephyr that's not very widely used to uh, generate linker scripts from CMake. So instead of, uh, of hard coding your linker script in GNU LD or LLD or LLVM LLD format, uh, you can actually define your linker script in CMake and then it gets generated There's a backend that then can generate either LD or, for example, scatter files for the um, ARMS Clank uh, fork. So, uh, so that's one option going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. My questions were well. Actually, they're not questions. They're, they're remarks on the on the on the 
mm, purpose of doing it. You asked that, uh, you weren't sure that it was... Uh, uh -huh. uh, originally, I remember very well that the, the, the first uh, use case that was brought up in the architecture working group and elsewhere was uh, being able to have one single binary that you flash in different boards that, that, with, that have slight, slight variations. So then when you boot, you decide which revision you, of, your, of the board you're running on and then uh, in, you know, decide, deal with the difference in hardware. But I wonder if that particular use case is actually solved with the deferred init. Because uh, if you put all the devices that can change in your device tree with as deferred, then at that point <coughs> in the in the um, in the boot process where you know which PCB you're on, you can decide. Then uh, the, the, the 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 reason um, some users want a single binary instead of compiling for different revisions of the PCB is that it's. Um, uh, it's well, the, the, the way to test. So not, not to have one, one binary that can verify both in development PCBs and in production PCBs without recompiling. So that's for, you know, to make sure that nothing else has changed, so to speak. So, so that, that was one, but I wonder if that use case is no longer relevant for this, for the init, because we have now, uh, now deferred init. And then there was another use case that I think is valid still for the init is, imagine you have a bus, right, I square C, for example, but then um, one of the lines, sometimes you want to use it as a GPIO, that happens depending on, and, uh, depending on the limitations and pin. So you might want to shut down the peripheral temporarily, use the line as a GPIO, and then bring it up again. That, that has, uh, well, I've seen that in the wild. Sure. Yeah, okay. that's it. I'm glad it's being recorded. <laughs> yeah. um, while I'm walking over here, I got a, a comment on, you, you made a comment about the power management and the integration of that, and I think coming in, in and out of power management states uh, have the same challenges in, as, as what you're doing here at the very beginning of initialization order, because you also have the reverse of taking it down in reverse order potentially, and, and stuff like that. So I think as we work through this, we have to keep that part in mind as far as what we're doing. Regarding that, we also need, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Regarding that, I think it's, it's, it's uh, important to note here that like with power management, at least the way we are doing it, that, that right now, I mean, when you go into a lower power state in a, in a, in a, in a device, the device is still there. It's it's loaded and everything, and then you go in. So this is not the init per se, yeah? Because depending who you talk to, this can mean that, hey, I am just going to unload that completely from the memory, you know, just, you know, in a destructive fashion, and then load it again. This is like, you know, in, in, in Linux, uh, removing a, a module and loading it again, something like that, yeah? So that, I, I'm not sure about the use cases there, but now we have also, the uh, uh, loadable extensions. This could be like something to look at. Yeah. Uh, my my question, my original question. I'm sorry for uh, di uh, diverting. Is uh, regarding dependencies. What type of dependencies are going to be uh, uh, introducing, and uh, in, in, in basically in which direction? Because as you mentioned, we have we have device drivers, we have service services. I mean, yesterday, uh, uh, Rodrigo was talking about demons and so on. So what type of dependencies uh, would be uh, possible with this, with this approach? And where do we want to go? And just to uh, emphasize here, what is, what is really the, 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 the main, I mean, how are we going, is device tree going to be really the main thing that everything runs around it? Or is device tree just going to be one, service, let's call it like, or one subsystem that actually provides information into a bigger initialization uh, type of uh, uh, service that we will have. Yeah, the approach of like create, getting everything and uh, putting on this uh, topological list to sort, it doesn't really matter from where the information is coming from. I started with the, the, the season eight, the services. But there is actually nothing preventing us from actually getting that from the device tree. The information doesn't need to be there somehow. And I don't see exactly why the limitations, but I mean, you can work around with like instead of before, after or something, but at some point it, that can be problematic. So I don't think that we should uh, have any constraints there. Uh, if you want something to run, if you want to say GPIO runs after something, you should be able to. Right yeah. now it's not implemented, but I, I believe that. I'll, I'll comment on the 
power management thing, we it's like an, uh, we have a chip that when it goes into the PM mode three, it loses all settings. <laughs> It's so annoying, and so, um, but so then you find you're just basically doing a, the whole initialization again, right? And so it's, it's having a framework to just walk through it again is would be pretty useful. Yeah, yes, I I see a lot of value in what you're talking about here, but you, a couple one thing you didn't mention that we have today, um, I've been searching for it while I've been sitting here, but there is a K config setting to allow us to get. A warning. I think it's a warning. I'm not sure if it's warning or error. Uh, warning or error. Whenever uh, you basically have priorities out of line. So, for example, uh, you have an I squared C device that emits before the I squared C bus, and at build time, you're you're, you're notified of that. I honestly wish that were on by default, but that. It's not, and I once I found that I was I was thrilled because it just is one less thing I have to uh -huh. check myself. Um, what I would like to see is something along these lines because it's not it's imperfect. It does not take care of things like oh, GPIO has to be up before I square you know something uh -huh. along those lines. So if we had these dependencies in place uh, defined in place, it'd be nice if we could extend that warning so it was a build time uh, uh, thing. So we could know at build time, oh, you've got things out of order. And that way, you know, low to no impact on code size. Um, and some, just to comment on something someone else mentioned, they were talking about a service, if you could add an API to query a, is service ready. I, my only thought on that is I'd rather see it closer to how devices are today. If you're an I squared C device, you check to see is your bus ready. Uh -huh. And I'd rather just see it follow that model. I think services should be the same model. Services should be very much like devices, just maybe no hardware involved with a service. I do virtual device drivers already that are basically set in device tree, but there's, there's no hardware associated with them, and I use that model. So that's simplifying it with less things that's always good mm -hmm. yeah so j just a I mean this is actually riffing off of what honest was just talking about um, so so the point being obviously that traditionally you know we've we've looked at device tree as like a preprocessor that then compiles into a representation that happens to be this older mm -hmm. system thing um, that that doesn't need to go away right I mean like you know you can you can look at this the same way and the only distinction is you know that the 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 thing we're compiling into is now mixed between these these new service IDs. You know whether they be strings or compatibles or you know whatever you know, pick, uh -huh. pick pick whatever that is. And these these you know very strange looking you know pre kernel one pre kernel two early. I actually just literally had to go and look this stuff up. No one's ever really understood what those things mean, right? I mean they, they kind of move around. Um, early is total voodoo. That happens before arch kernel or uh, arch kernel init, which is like different architectures do different stuff in there, and it's just a hook that where you can do stuff in C. Um, you, you know, so whether something works in early, nobody really knows. Pre-kernel one kind of means before logging. Pre-kernel two <coughs> means after logging, but before, right? So if you just take those moments, um, you know, arch kernel init, logging init, uh, device init, right, um, and just turn those into IDs, the whole the whole thing becomes just a single like array of of, of compiled stuff. You don't need to worry about the older API, um, you know, to the extent to the extent of compatibility, right? But it's does we don't need to lose that, right? Like you can still you look at device tree as a preprocessor on top of this, and it just happens to be the names in there happen to correspond to device tree if you've enabled it. But I don't know, that, that's what I got. Uh, I'll say that the uh, like early just got added in a little while ago because it used to be the the hook that the vendors had to fix any kind of weirdnesses they had with their chip, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I only I only I only know this because I did a, a presentation of several years ago about the whole initialization flow. Yeah, yeah, don't rely on it. Um, while I'm walking back, I had one other question that I wrote down. You were talking about on, on a different topic about notifications. Have you thought about what your latency requirements are for when the notification needs to show up and stuff? Because I think that might dictate which mechanisms you want to use to make those notifications go around. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good question. I mean, when I, uh, when I I don't expect there will be too many notifications uh, going around, and I'm kind of expecting that most of the notifications will actually be using the listener from the bus as kind of 
right on the EU run. So I don't think that we'll be like subscribing for things and waiting. Or thing. I, I'm kind of expecting everything to be a listener. So having heard to some of the comments here and, and your presentation and, have been, and having been there when all of this transition happened back in the days in Linux, you know, from CCVNA to System D and the whole fast boot and, you know, getting things to boot in two seconds and whatever and people coming up with crazy ideas. But now, obviously, we, we, we have uh, System D uh, on Linux. And when I see some of the concepts here, you know, like with the, with the names and we were talking about external files and, and so on. Again, I'm not advocating for creating System Z or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but there are, there are a lot of things, lessons learned, and there's a lot of concepts uh, which can be interesting, at least from this uh, side of things, uh, that we, 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 again, we can look at and, and see how they make sense in our con For example, I mean, we were talking earlier, uh, you were talking about external files to define the dependencies. I mean, obviously, in systemd, we have the units where well, it's very basic. We have, we have also the, the init levels, the pre-kernel, one, two, kernel, post, etc. This could be also described as like, you know, milestones in the boot process that different services and device drivers can depend on and so on. And you also talked about the, the, uh, the, the labeling like device drivers with something a little bit more generic so other things can depend on it. So, I mean, if you think about it, this is like coming close at least to the idea in terms of how, I mean, the implementation obviously will be different. But I would, I would really encourage us, us here to, to start looking into this. I mean, we don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of Linux is different, but I think there is a lot to learn from there, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and one thing about system D and those things is it's like the management many things in runtime, so it's not like this is kind of more aesthetic approach, but maybe you want to initialize something later, like you have a crash and you want to start like some URs to send some information there. And that like could be nice if you could like, oh, I need the work and then all, all the dependencies are handled, then you can send information. So this question is coming from a place of ignorance, I suppose. But when I want to control the order that my uh, peripherals initialize in and find out if they failed, I write code to do that. And then I come to Zephyr and I see this auto magic with multi-build steps and a no way to know if a particular device failed until there's an update to the Zbus API. And I, as a kind of a lower end guy, go, what is going on here? Can you give me a little bit about why it's so complex to do something that seems simple to me? Uh, if you had like a callback that on the early installation you can, oh, and this failed, I mean, th th there's nothing much there. So we kind of, uh, it was one topic discussed on the deferred initialization in indeed. Uh, it could be potentially dangerous What because the, what you can do on those early steps uh, using the kernel is kind of limited. And if we kind of start using callbacks that are called on those uh, early steps, uh, you can like shoot yourself uh, on the foot. So that's basically one of, one of the things that we are kind of against having the callbacks uh, at the early steps of the, the boot. And then you can mess with the word there, basically. Yeah, and it, it just to answer kind of at like a higher level, um, it, it's just that there, we've got we're up to thousands of boards now, or you know, over a thousand. I think it is. There's there's a lot of stuff in there, and if every board's got its own C function that's going to go through and initialize this and initialize this and initialize this, it becomes kind of unmaintainable. I actually was just in a, a, a talk about uh, uh, audio uh, 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 DAPM widgets in the Linux kernel, and they have a very similar problem. Where like every device out there in the world has this big topology that's listed in Z code, um, and 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 yeah, it just turns into a big mess. And well, so I device tree solves that problem. Just to continue on that, on, to briefly on that topic on, on the complexity. So aside what, what, what Andy just said, I mean, if you had for every single board and combination of kconfig option, imagine just uh, have to have a board file .c with that sequence. I mean, for every board, right? The, it quickly becomes unmaintainable. That's for sure. But th then there's also the fact that you want. Sorry. 
Yeah, I think so. If you if it's written, if it's well written, why not? Yeah, uh, indeed, it is. It's it's a little bit like Y device tree, right? Uh, y device tree. I, I could have my header files enabling this, uh, but have you tried then combining all support, sort of unified support for all types of boards without device tree? Then it becomes uh, really unmanageable. So this is similar. It's it's about providing infrastructure that almost every embedded developer needs, but you need to provide it in a way that uh, people can express it, uh, if possible in a data-oriented way, in this case with device tree, and, um, and, you, and, the, and then it's verified by the system and everybody uses the same system. That's the whole point of Zephyr. Uh, otherwise, you can you do bare metal, and, but the complexity in general, long-term, is definitely worth it in, from my point of view because it gives you all of this. <coughs> well, that, that alarm was the end of the time, so let's uh, give them some applause. This is a really well-engaging project. <laughs> And, and he, he has a lot of links to PRs, so. <laughs> <laughs> Work to do. <laughs> so so engage there and engage in the meetings, guys. Thank you. Thank you.